Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of the ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'm George Fairbanks, a software engineer at Google and the author of the book, Just Enough Software Architecture. I write the Pragmatic Designer column for IEEE Software Magazine, and I lead the software design education program at Google. I'm also an ACM member. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the ACM or what it has to offer, here's some more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources <clears throat> that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM provides access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts from a broad spectrum of computing topics. Support for educational education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards, and the ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items uh, shown on the slide in front of you. If you have questions at any time, please type them in using Zoom's Q&A feature. I'll organize the questions as Titus speaks, and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end. This session is being recorded and it will be archived. You'll receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out and help us improve our tech talks. Today's presentation is Trade-Offs in the Software Workflow by Titus Winters. Titus is a principal software engineer at Google, where he has worked since 2010. He's the library lead for Google C++ code base, 250 million lines of code that will be edited by 12,000 distinct engineers in a month. He served for several years as the chair of the subcommittee for the design of the C++ standard library. For the last 10 years, Titus and his team have been organizing, maintaining, and evolving the foundational components of Google C++ code base using modern automation and tooling. Along the way, he started several Google projects that are believed to be in the top 10 largest refactorings in human history. That unique scale and perspective has informed all of his thinking on the care and feeding of software systems. His book, Software Engineering at Google, also known as The Flamingo Book, was published by O'Reilly in early 2020. He uses that experience to represent modern computer, uh, modern software engineering practice in the CS 2023 ACM IEEE CS AAAI <laughs> Computer Science Curricula Steering Committee, uh, updating curriculum guidelines for undergraduate students. So with that, Titus, please take it away. All right, uh, Jan, can you swap out the slides? There we go. Okay, all good. Well, uh, first off, I want to say, of course, thanks for having me. Uh, these talks are always exciting, and it's nice to share you know, the things that I've been thinking about. I want to talk today about some very big questions that I think get to the heart of how we build reliable software at reasonable cost. And I don't mean big questions like, which programming language is better? I mean the really big stuff. The questions of how do we build software? How do we optimize our processes? The costs and benefits that go into all of that and that we toss around in the abstract fairly, uh, fairly regularly, but we don't usually pin down precisely. These are things like, when does software actually have value? What's the cost of a defect? How do we prevent defects from reaching users? And what is the value in doing so? These are, to my mind, software engineering matters through and through. If you're just learning to program, these are not the most pressing concern. And if you're a startup, you may or may not really need to be thinking about these things either, especially compared to just writing code and building out the product. But in a certain context, with a certain scale, these questions are going to inevitably start to rise up. And while some of them, I think, are easy to answer, some are effectively impossible. And I believe that if we find ways to think about these questions, they can be a positive influence on the software process, even in a startup sort of environment. These are meaty questions, but they have very important implications, especially for people like myself that work in infrastructure domains. The question of what is the value of preventing a defect is especially critical. Consider some infrastructure teams and projects that I collaborate with. The OSS Fuzz team at Google 
has discovered tens of thousands of bugs, many potentially exploitable in over 500 open source projects that the broad open source ecosystem depends upon, often quite heavily. These are things like image compression, font rendering, uh, parsing, JSON, crypto, real crypto, not Bitcoin. I don't know the exact statistics, but I'll charitably assume that 5% of those might have already been known vulnerabilities and another low fraction might actually be exploitable, call that 20%. Those, even with those conservative estimates, that still leaves maybe 6,000 exploitable bugs in the open source computing ecosystem discovered by this one team, which I think is like five or 10 people. Does that matter? And if so, how much? A friend of mine is responsible for our integration testing systems at Google. These are the frameworks and features that we use to test whether two different versions of services are compatible without just running them together in production. And a stunning number of bugs are identified because of systems like these, often as a result of protocol changes or version skew. These are notoriously hard types of problems to spot with unit tests or discern in code review. So in a lot of cases, I really think that's the earliest place in the workflow that those types of errors are reliably spotted. Does maintaining that system matter? And if so, how much? Or for that matter, hey, I made a book and a few tens of thousands of people have read it. Or there are millions of citations for things that I've written on C++ best practices. Does that matter? And if so, how much? In the end, these are justifiably hard questions to answer. In all of these cases, I would argue that we believe that it matters. But if anyone asks how much, tries to put any sort of precision to it, the whole discussion goes off the rails. What are the units of how much does this matter? This is where we're heading, but we're not there yet. We're going to start smaller. When does software have value? I hope that we can agree that software isn't actually providing value until it makes it to users for whatever definition of users you might have. Like, it is a theoretically valuable resource to have in the same way that a gold mine might be, but it's not providing value until it's used. We aren't generally creating software for its own sake. We're creating software to solve a problem. In fact, Mary Shaw has a great definition along those lines. Engineering is creating cost-effective solutions to practical problems by applying scientific knowledge to building things in the service of humankind. Disclaimer here, of course, I'm largely speaking about professional industrial software. If you just like sitting down to hack on things as a hobby, that is great. Certainly don't take any of this as me dismissing the pleasure and potential for creative expression in software. But by and large, that's not usually what we're getting paid for. And you're probably not going to get too far in performance reviews by claiming, boy, I had a great time hacking instead of I shipped these 10 features. I'm pointing a lot of this talk at the professional software engineering industry. And even within the industry, you are certainly going to do better when you can motivate your developers. They are humans in a technical and creative domain. Just don't confuse hobby code with professional code. Remember that it's programming when clever is a compliment and software engineering with clever is an accusation. One way to see the notion, the value of software is when it ships is looking at reducing work in progress. The book, The Phoenix Project by Gene Kim is a very memorable fictionalized presentation of how to refocus an IT organization on efficiency and good outcomes. And one of the major lessons that's portrayed there draws in, uh, inspiration from factory assembly lines, the Toyota production approach, Kanban, et cetera. We want to reduce the work in progress. That's work that you've already put in some of the cost to, uh, to manage, but you're not getting any value out of yet. And this makes sense, right? Which team is gonna be more productive? The team careful that puts out one release a month and they have a one month commit to deploy uh, delay or team feedback, right? Uh, where they do a thousand releases a month with an average of an hour between commit and deploy. And this type of difference is actually achievable. If we assume that team feedback isn't just churning out low quality releases and has to roll all of them back, but instead they have found the workflow and automation needed to make most of those releases stable, it's very hard to imagine this setup not outperforming team careful. Experimentation, user feedback, stability are all made hugely easier when you can release frequently. If anecdotes don't convince you, maybe the research results do. For research results on the software engineering and DevOps workflow, I cannot oversell how much I love the work done by the DevOps Research Association, DORA. Full disclosure, Google acquired them a bunch of years ago. I had nothing to do with that, and I speak with them far too rarely. 
Dora started a project called the State of DevOps Report in 2014 that seeks to study and classify organizations based on their technical outcomes and look at what practices they self-report and how those practices influence those outcomes. It's a broad industry-wide survey methodology with a lot of statistical methods that are frankly a little beyond me, but the results give us some mechanism to capture formally what anecdote and intuition has suggested for a while. They publish individual yearly results, and they also put out a book that covered the first four years, which is Accelerate by Nicole Forsgren et al. I cite this all the time. I wish it was a little bit more current since the program and the industry have continued to advance. One of the most fundamentally important outcomes according to their analysis is culture. In that formulation, the more power-oriented or rule-oriented your team and organizational culture, the worse your technical outcomes are going to be. It's not an easy all or nothing, it's a spectrum, but there are some common touch points. On the power-oriented end of the spectrum, we get the sort of organizational culture and control structure that you expect when managing an organization with little humility, respect, or trust. These are environments where, that work primarily because I said so. These are the behaviors you might use if you're managing a group of unwilling recruits, people that roll their eyes and have to be prodded to do anything. Individuals in these structures don't cooperate. Pointing out a problem leads to shooting the messenger as often as not, and motivating people is challenging. Communication pathways could just be a duplicate of the org chart, and communicating outside of the chain of command is risky and discouraged. New ideas are shot down or stolen, and perhaps most tellingly, in such an organization, an honest and novel mistake can still lead to negative consequences. Whoever brought down the server or whoever can be blamed for it might be disciplined or fired. Weird to say, but a slightly better structure is when we become a rule-oriented bureaucracy. The, we do things because the rules say we do things. Individuals in those environments may cooperate, but it's kind of ad hoc at best. And those that report problems are often ignored, especially if they don't know the right department or procedures to report to. Everyone's responsibilities are very narrowly defined. They're gonna do the job, but only within the boundaries outlined by the rules. Communicating across teams and departments is tolerated, but not necessarily the norm. New ideas are potentially a problem, especially because when we focus on the rules for their own sake, the rules are the goal and new things don't come with established rules. Honest and novel mistakes may still lead to consequences, depending on how wisely your rules have been crafted, but there's at least a greater chance that those consequences will be directed at someone that's honestly responsible for the mistake. The best case, the thing we need to be aiming for, especially in tech, is a generative outcomes-focused performance-oriented structure and culture. Places that have this sort of environment are going to be the ones where the rest of this talk matters the most. These are the places where teammates are highly cooperative. Communicating about bad news early is encouraged so that we can solve the problem. Risks are shared, communication can ignore the org chart, and new ideas are embraced. In a performance-oriented environment, an honest and novel mistake leads to an investigation. How is it possible to make that mistake in the first place? The research flat out says it, without necessarily giving justification or reasons for it, but having a performance-oriented culture leads to better organizational performance. You get more value from your software process, and you ship more uh, when you address this. It is foundational. Like Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you have a culture of blame, a culture of because I said so, a culture of how dare you go outside the chain of command, you're going to have much worse results, especially in software. And if you don't understand that, I honestly recommend you stop watching this talk, go spend the next hour learning more about the impact of culture on organizational performance. Because if you get this wrong, very little that I'm about to say is going to make a lot of difference. Culture is foundational. That said, in the target, in the performance-oriented culture, it's always okay to ask questions. And so we have to deal with questions like, why are we doing it this way? Have we considered changing these things? Ideas that might only have to convince one technical leader and just be enshrined in a power-oriented or rule-oriented culture will be continually questioned in a performance-oriented culture. It's harder to be a technical leader in those environments because you have to explain it. And that can lead to some trouble when we're trying to explain why we do things a certain way. There's a difference between being right, knowing the right answer, and being convincing, persuading everyone else. This is deeply tied up in my motivations for giving this talk. Per Dora and Accelerate, the next most important thing if you get culture sort of nailed down is to focus on continuous delivery. 
And a lot of the nuts and bolts of the software process are wrapped up in the DORA heading of continuous delivery. And we need to focus on this as a strategic goal. It's not the mechanism that you use, it's the target. And building in quality, automating is the mechanism. We need to be aiming for fast cycle times, short OODA loops, continuous delivery, fast experimentation. But the mechanisms that we use to get there are much more mundane. It's better version control policies, it's trunk-based development, it's deployment automation, it's testing automation, it's continuous integration. So leaders, your job is to set culture and you have to play an active part in that. And then set strategic goals like continuous delivery and improving your release cadence and then let your engineers figure out what they need to do with the knowledge from their frontline work on their team to achieve that. But it matters. In the DORA formulation, we get my favorite horrifying statistics. High performing organizations are 46 times more frequent deployments, hours versus weeks, 440 times faster from commit to deploy, it's hours versus quarters of lag time, 170 times faster mean time to recover, if there is an outage, minutes versus days, and a five times lower average rate of failure for changes, chance of new bugs, of rollbacks, et cetera. But you get to that result by adding steps to the workflow, continuous integration, testing, code review, even more constrained use of version control. And I find that contradiction fascinating. We're slowing down, adding all of these steps to go faster, but we're aiming to go faster. How do you make sense of that? These are the stakes, right? Software has value when we deploy regularly and rapidly, when we're reducing the work in progress, when we aspire to and are procedurally aiming towards continuous deployment. This works best in organizations with a generative performance oriented culture, but those are also the environments where people are going to question things the most. So if you're making changes to the workflow, you better be prepared to be convincing about it. It's essential that we figure out how to be convincing because those stats are everything. Software has benefit when we provide it to users and the longer that it takes us to do so, the more that we're spending money without getting any benefit from it. The magnitude of that value, our net benefit or revenue, actual dollars, is basically derived from how many users you've got, how much time they can use their new features and how valuable those features are. If you have no users or a lot of willing users but you can't get your software to them, you're not gonna get any value out of your software. Nothing particularly surprising there, but this is the value side of the actual dollars, real money balance. In this formulation, a defect would be viewed as anything that's reducing that value side, actual dollars uh, part of the equation. That could be by reducing the value of the software in the steady state, could be reducing number of users, could be reducing uptime. That is very broad for a definition of a defect, but I really like the breadth in this case because it allows for the possibility that your benefit is being reduced by functional attributes, bugs, quality attributes, efficiency, latency, bad design, and even reputational costs. Importantly though, these need to be constrained to the defects that make it to users, the ones that manifest in production that users actually see and that become a change to the bottom line. But I think we have to treat those distinctly from the defects that we catch earlier in the process. One way to see that is to look at two extremes. How strongly can we clamp down on the production of defects, writing bugs, and how do we handle defects in high quality or safety critical environments? I would argue that none of us believes that we can actually hire an engineering staff that doesn't write any bugs. And if you disagree with that, please let me talk to you. Did you hire space aliens? Because humans definitely make mistakes. So if the input to the software process is even slightly buggy, and it is, but there exist environments where we effectively cannot tolerate defects, the software process itself is what is filtering those out. Defects identified and remediated during the process are a natural part of the process. They're the cost of doing business. It's the defects that make it all the way through the process that are super bad. And this context also matters because it's a distinctly different thing to let software defects make it to users in safety critical areas compared to widespread but just annoying bugs in your emoji picker. At this point, I hope that the strategic value of continuous deployment and small releases might be a little bit more intuitive. If you have a defect that slipped through that only got spotted in production 
and is currently harming the bottom line. It sure is nice if you can cut a new release, fix the problem, test it properly, and deploy it quickly. In the event that your workflow takes days or weeks to qualify a release, if that bad defect slips through, you may be coping with it for days while you produce a new release to mitigate it. Or you're going to cut a release without testing and just hope things work. Pro tip, don't do that. The capability of releasing quickly is extremely valuable and, and kind of slept on. Once you get up to speed, other parts of your workflow of, of your process, like release branching or cherry picking particular fixes, become vastly less needed, allowing you further organizational efficiency gains purely as a result of we're just going faster. And that starts bleeding into one of the points that I think is surprising to a lot of people, especially those in leadership positions or that aren't interacting with the day-to-day -day grind on testing and releasing. Pushing for faster, smaller releases is not asking us to sacrifice quality. The tools that make fast releases feasible are automated testing and release tooling and release automation, which also make defect detection faster, cheaper, and easier. You get both quality and velocity. It's not a choice. First off, though, let's look at all of the things that we're doing to prevent defects in the first place. And I'm going to present this in terms that I'm most familiar with. Google does a lot of things, but a lot of it, most of it, is still production backends and web or mobile frontends. So this is certainly flavored as deploying services of various kinds in production in order to power web and mobile usage. I don't think that any of the results I'm discussing here are super dependent on that. I think this sort of reasoning and analysis applies to mobile development, embedded hardware, whatever. You're going to change the set of steps and the cost factors and maybe your risk tolerance. Uh, but you know, safety critical systems have a different level of risk tolerance than web search does. First off, it's really essential, once again, to note that from reaching users is very load bearing here. Programming is hard. Engineering is even harder. Humans are fallible. As a Google friend of mine said, nothing in all of our software process addresses the creation of defects. Engineers write bugs at a prodigious rate. Only education, training, and experience affects the defect creation rate. But the earlier that we catch those defects in the workflow, the lower the impact. And if we do a good enough job of this, then the final released software appears to be nice and high quality. Tests and other forms of defect detection aren't preventing defects. They're detecting them faster. They're preventing them from reaching users and reducing the value of our software, at least with some probability. Here is a maybe incomplete list of steps that might be relevant for a single change. Depending on if it's a new feature, a bug fix, a configuration change, a different set of these will most likely apply. You have an idea, you write out a design, you have it reviewed, you sit down to start implementing, you write some unit tests, you get it to pass the unit tests. You send it for code review, static analysis might kick off. You go back and forth with your code reviewer a little bit and up the quality of your stuff. You do the unit testing again because you made some changes, now you submit your code. At this point, other people on the team can depend on your change. Post-submit unit testing gets you a ground truth for did you break the build. Post-submit dynamic analysis probably kicks off at some point in there. Usually dynamic analysis is a little bit more expensive, so we don't do it all the time. Integration testing starts making sure that our simulations of the larger interactions between systems are sufficiently valid. Release qualification, hey, we have a maybe release. Is this going to be any good? And once you get through that qualification, you start ramping up how many users can actually see this. You do that a little bit at a time. This is canary. Eventually, it's actually deployed. Hooray, you call your parents. You say, you can use my new feature. It's cool. But even then, we're not really done because as the site reliability folks will tell you, you need to actually have monitoring. You can't tell that your software is still providing value without monitoring. There's a host of things that might also be done for non-functional testing focusing on latency and quality attributes and resource efficiency. Those tend to not be directly involved in defect production, uh, prevention, so I'm glossing over those pieces. But I want to point out, this is a lot, especially when we look at things like high-performing organizations are 440 times faster commit to deploy. Are you going to be 440 times faster of in doing anything if we're doing all of these steps or even a subset of them? To some extent, I think the point here is that this traditional chronological autobiographical description of the development process, what I just did, is misleading. If you look at it chronologically, then you have an idea and you go through this endless list of steps before that idea actually makes it to users and begins to accrue benefit. But if you take instead 
software provides value when it is deployed as axiomatic. And we recognize that defects that manifest in production are the real threat, then you have a clearer tension to manage. Production is what matters, but is high risk. What can we do that is predictive of, is this release good without exposing us to the fullness of that risk? Oh, canary release and release qualification tests. But then we notice relying on those is expensive. What can we do that's cheaper and predictive of this will pass release qualification? Oh, that's integration tests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, we're adding steps, but the purpose of those steps is not to slow things down. It's to find as many defects as cheaply and early as possible. Imagine if I wrote out directions for how to find your lost keys. I would probably say, start where you last remember them, check your pockets, et cetera, et cetera, before going to just look everywhere in the house, tear everything apart. You do the cheap things first, even if they're not guaranteed to work. If it has a reasonable likelihood of success and it's cheap, do that earlier. Every defect detection phase in the workflow is specifically trading off between the cost of a potential defect and the fidelity of the resulting signal. How much risk of false positives or false negatives do you suffer as a result of having that analysis in there? Every defect detection phase is also adding some probably non-zero latency which slows down the manifestation of your benefits, as well as the raw time and just resource cost of running that phase. Your CI systems require compute, right? The conventional wisdom suggests that a defect detected earlier in the workflow is cheaper to resolve. And research from as far back as the 1980s from the US Department of Defense at NASA was very explicit. In those workflows at that point, spotting a defect early by one phase was roughly 10x cheaper. Our war workflows these days are much less waterfall-y. Nobody I know that puts much stock in those 10x numbers these days, but earlier is better is still pretty clear. This is a very straightforward, to my mind, manifestation of the shift left philosophy. The earlier in the workflow that you catch a defect, the cheaper it is to resolve it. This is intuitive, but kind of hard to capture, I think, mostly because we're using cheaper in a squishy sort of fashion. It's not really an absolute. If we found ourselves asking engineers to run the release qualification tests before sending things for code review, that could be an extremely expensive process and cost a ton of latency, slowing everything down. Shift left is good you know, shorthand, but should really be expanded to add some nuance. It's not about performing big expensive defect detection tasks earlier. It's about the cost of identifying a defect earlier goes down in a sensibly designed workflow. When we consider the phases of the workflow and how to optimize those balances, we need to account for the cost of each step. How expensive is it to run, right? Your CI systems are great value, but you are paying for that compute cost I mentioned. The latency, reducing the onset of any value of the software you're working on, and the opportunity cost, especially for design and code review, you're turning more human minds towards double checking things rather than creating value from scratch. Depending on your risk tolerance and deployment mechanisms for your organization, you're gonna have a different set of workflow steps and perhaps a different focus, but the goal is still to filter the vast majority of the defects that were created before they make it to users and generally to do so as quickly and cheaply as possible. But how do we characterize the value of that filtering? Because really at this point, we've added lots of process, lots of safeties. How do you determine the value of those steps? Do they pull their weight? Do we need to invest more in those? Or individually, how do you determine the value of a defect that you prevented early? It's a story that I like here. In 2017, a Google SRE, uh, Julian Goodwin, came one keystroke away from taking Google out of the global routing tables. In the process of rolling out some previously agreed upon and ideally mundane housekeeping changes, Julian's spidey sense tingled, right? It looked like a bigger routing change than he and his colleagues had discussed. I won't go into the details. I suggest you go just watch the talk directly for the fun details and scary stories. But I think the ish scale of the issue is very clear. If you drop Google out of the internet, how long does it take to get that back up? Where do you even push routing changes from, right? I think it's quite plausible that it would have been minutes, if not hours, for Google network engineers to get back into a position where they could re-advertise Google exists without relying on any Google infrastructure from the public internet or vice versa. Of course, this is all much improved since the incident. 
conservatively, if everything went great and you could mitigate this in 10 minutes, I think we still dropped off the internet, stopped serving users, and took a huge reputational hit. Given the annual revenue for 2017, I think in the absolute best case, this is a $2 million glitch. If we put a dollar amount of to value Julian deciding not to push that button, I think that's a pretty conservative upper bound on that value. Had he pushed one button in an otherwise normal operation, it would have cost the company at least 2 million and potentially 10 times that. So here's the question. Was his choice not to act worth $2 million? Should we give him like a million dollar bonus? I think in this case, or really all such cases, there are very contradictory arguments that we could make for valuing those actions or inactions. The skeptic might say that training, instinct, expertise, and our existing safety checks worked properly. It's certainly bad that we came one action away from causing widespread internet havoc, but importantly, we didn't. If we had reason to believe that future instances of the same problem might be common, might have different personnel that made worse choices, you could hypothesize the need to improve safeties and systems and training. But from what we can see, the evidence says the system worked properly. Goodwin did his job and nothing more, minimum reward necessary. Or on the flip side, the more generous approach, we came one bad decision away from disaster. The value of making the good choice seems logically like it should be the inverse of the cost of making the bad choice. But even that is hard to measure precisely. You probably noticed I'm intentionally making very conservative estimates and they are wildly under-informed estimates. It's impossible to measure these things precisely or directly, specifically because the bad outcome didn't actually happen because of these interventions. How do you measure against the counterfactual? A probabilistic way to look at the problem is just as bad. If you took the protagonists in stories like these and replayed the events 100 times somehow, do you still get good results? Or do you get the bad outcome in some fraction of those replays? This is really asking, are, are our outcomes predetermined or is there chance and luck? That is a deep philosophical and existential sort of question, and none of the answers are entirely satisfying. Predeterminism is a huge bummer of a worldview, but our outcomes are determined by chance. We can't measure the probabilities or the impact of chance is a real drag when we're trying to analyze the costs and benefits of a complex system. I'm just going to make the claim there's no clear and perfectly convincing argument that is going to sway everyone into agreement on which of these positions is the right one. Even in extreme cases where we're one action away from disaster, you're not going to agree. And that's a drag. But what's worse is that most instances of what's the value of detecting this early aren't that last minute. They aren't that extreme. Imagine you're writing in Rust and the compiler catches a memory safety bug that would, have been, would not have been caught in something like C++. To make it easy, we'll just say, I define that if this bug makes it to users, it costs us a million dollars. Did using Rust just save us a million dollars? Almost certainly not, because tests, code review, CI, release qualification, et cetera, all could have caught it. If it was big enough to cost a million dollars, what are the odds that nothing else in the workflow would have noticed? So how much did Rust save us in this hypothetical? We're never gonna have consensus. Again, like the scary stories about nuclear war or routing table mishaps, you can make a plausible sounding but refutable argument for anything from zero to a million dollars, but it's probably closer to the zero end of that because of additional steps in the workflow. We need a different approach. We, I think, have to get out of the habit of asking, what's the value, what's the benefit of having stopped this defect? But if we're not gonna agree on the exact values, maybe we can at least agree on the scaling factors. So one idea I've been really enjoying lately is to dodge the strict quantitative approach. Making a direct comparison to dollar savings or specific benefits seems a little odd anyway. When you claim credit for product successes or dollar savings through efficiency, you don't divvy up the exact share of the credit either. You might say, I led a team that launched feature X and that increased revenue by $42 million. But that's not actually saying I increased revenue by $42 million. You're setting sort of an upper bound on how much credit there is, but the entire credit is shared among the team the infrastructure you built on, the people that helped review your designs, et cetera. Software is a team sport after all. See previous discussion of culture. But just like with calculus or big O notation, I don't think that we're actually acutely concerned with the precise numbers in question, or we shouldn't be because we're never gonna actually agree. What does matter is the general shape of the graphs, the growth rates and which components factor into the costs here most aggressively. And as with basically everything in software engineering, I think the only bits that matter, or certainly the ones that matter most, 
are time and people. The most compelling model I have found for estimating the defect cost uh, is this. The cost for defects that you identify and fix is proportional to the number of humans impacted times the time since the defect was introduced into a source file. If you're getting super fancy, you could talk about some factor for severities, but since we can't agree on the linear coefficient for how valuable was it to prevent this before it progressed to the next phase or made it to users, I think we probably don't want to get into severity. Here, instead of trying to argue of how expensive it would be if we caught it in a later step, just simplify. We know roughly we can estimate how expensive it was in this reality. So let's minimize the costs of the things that we did spend time and attention on. As a simple estimate, number of engineers exposed to the thing since the time that it was created seem like the essential qualities that we're trying to minimize. This model has a lot of nice properties around the edges. When your IDE surfaces a static analysis warning while you're writing code, those defects are awfully cheap to resolve, right? That's one developer second. And catching that defect with unit tests before you send it out for code review is still limiting the impact of the bug. But once you spot it in code review, it's at least twice as expensive. Someone else had to read it and understand it and communicate to you about it. So you have communication and education costs on top of everything else. If it makes it through code review into post-submit CI, it could stop the whole team from submitting and it's harder to diagnose. You might have to do some bisection to track down exactly which change got committed that's causing the failure. And then you have to interrupt someone to get it fixed. And on the far end of the example, if you don't catch anything until Canary, the cost of the defect is skyrocketing because you've impacted potentially all of the developers on the team. And now you need to wait until a no potential new release. Abandoning this one, fixing the bug and cutting a new potential release is not cheap although you can make it cheaper by really investing in continuous deployment. What I'm not saying here is time sense defect times the user population, because end users, remember, are represented in the, these are actual dollars side of the, the benefit of the equation. And those values and benefits are a much more absolute set of units than we get with our unmanifested part of the workflow, part of the filtering, part of the process uh, costs. The other thing that we ought to be just taking as a given at this point is in a sensible workflow, the reason that shift left works is because you're reducing one or both of the people affected and the elapsed amount of time. Place where that would fail as a model is when you ignore the inherent costs of those additional workflow steps or when that step is slowing you down so much that you can't deploy increased value anymore. The goal has to be to ship as much value as quickly as possible. Remember Dora and Accelerate, where you're aiming for continuous deployment. And we improve the benefit, we improve the value, we improve our bottom line most effectively by making constant small improvements, uh, getting those out the door quickly and or increasing the user base. All of the steps except actually deploying in our workflow are about communication or defect detection or both. And defects do creep in as things change. Defect detection and resolution, it just needs to be considered to scale with the amount of time and the number of humans impacted. Yes, you're gonna to have to fix that defect at some point, especially with long lived code. We know it's cheaper to do it earlier. So let's just focus on this as cost reduction. The overhead in the workflow needs to be constrained by this ultimate strategic goal of continuous delivery. And when you're looking at the optimization of the workflow, looking at the types of bugs that are slipping through or the amount of time that we're burning on the workflow process itself, that's when we use this time times people estimate to compare the efficacy and cost of each phase. If a certain class of bugs seems to be getting through a lot, you might look for, is there something that we can reasonably do earlier in the workflow to address that? To me, this is the fundamental insight. Anything worth fixing is going to manifest somewhere and some when. We're going to pay some cost for discovery and remediation at some point because you cannot hire an engineering or development staff that doesn't introduce defects. If we focus on it as the value of detecting it early, then you have to be able to estimate the magnitude of a result that didn't happen, evaluate that counterfactual. Instead, what I propose is we sum up the defect detection and resolution costs of everything that actually went wrong in our development process over a given time interval, estimate the cost for detecting them when we did, and try to minimize that. And even if you detect it, but don't act on it, that's risky, but maybe you know what you're doing. Put another way, we can't get trapped by trying to estimate the value of a defect that didn't make it to users. 
I don't think the units on those even match. The value of Rust catching our memory safety bug is very hard to pin down. But recognizing that we're going to pay that cost eventually, the question is when, where in the workflow, how much it'll cost, and what the value reduction looks like in the event that it makes it to users. This, I think we could maybe get consensus on. How much turmoil did that defect add to the workflow for others, and how hard is it to remediate? So I think this is really the full set of inputs that would go into stochastically simulating the workflow. It's defect generated per developer per unit time, cost of a developer hour, average number of developer hours affected per defect, the time and latency delay on each phase, and the raw resource cost of running that phase of the workflow. So the optimization problem as a whole is basically this big stochastic optimization. Each generated defect is filtered through the workflow. Some fraction of them are caught at each step and you pay for that step. Some fraction are false negatives, which increases our costs as well. All of them take time, which increases our work in progress and delays the onset of increase to or improvement to the bottom line. It's obviously pretty complex, but the nice thing is all of these values can be approximated from experience and general signals. We aren't trying to measure anything that didn't happen. Does this seem to have the right behavior in the limits? A startup might take a laissez-faire approach to technical debt, betting on the idea that anything that isn't manifesting for their current users can wait until the business becomes stable. This is risky in that you don't know for sure when your defects are gonna actually start hurting users, but in some cases could be a very viable strategy. In exchange, the startup workflow can focus much more on agility, new features, and keeping development latency as low as possible. A bug detected in post-submit CI, I think is much, much obviously, or obviously much more costly and risky than if it had been discovered pre-submit. By the math of it, the bug is now visible to at least the whole team or everyone that would run against your CI system. In a trunk-based development or live at head model for utility code, that could also be the whole size of your workforce. And for anyone like me that's broken the build for basically the whole company, yeah, that's about how severe it feels. Interestingly, that math, I think, also suggests that your pre-submit and rollback policies probably deserve to be population dependent. Breaking a test or breaking the build for a small leaf team of three people is wholly different than breaking the core infrastructure and preventing testing or submission for 300 people. Some might see this as an argument against the monorepo approach. I don't really think that's the case, though. At Google, we tried a couple of things to mitigate the blast radius for utility code breaking the build. And the thing that seems to work best is what we call auto rollback, which does what it sounds like. Uh, if a CI system identifies that a large number of targets stopped building as the result of a single change, you automatically generate a rollback, which cuts the human investigation and triage out of the loop and drastically cuts the amount of time it takes to fix a widespread build break. The cost of that defect is scaling by time times the blast radius of the uh, build break we can't affect that blast radius after the fact, but we can reduce the time. And this turns out to work. How about bigger things like log4j? I would argue that the estimated costs in this model there would be proportional to a decade since the feature was introduced, times half the size of the Java developer population globally. So something like 20 million engineer years. Yeah, this is a big freaking deal. This is why I made the headlines. With a model like this in hand, you can look at optimizing the workflow holistically. Questions like this could be statistically inferred and managed individually. Should a test be run pre-submit and should it block submission if the test fails? I think this mostly depends on the true positive and false negative rates of that test, the latency of adding that test to your CI system, and the size of the population that would be affected if there's a false negative. You might also have costs for culprit finding and, and other things. If your team size is very large, the test is very useful in spotting bugs, and the test runs very fast, then absolutely. But if the team is very small, or the test has low predictive powers, low fidelity, or the test would increase latency a lot, probably don't run it pre-submit. Questions like, if our CI isn't green, should we allow commits? I think this depends very much on whether the average breakage would be compounded or independent of other commits. If the existing breakage outage is clearly contained, and isn't affecting quality or correctness predictions from the other tests and, and builds that you're running, I think that's fine. Go ahead, submit anyway. Our build managers may need a little nuance, which is inspired directly by SREs and on-call response playbooks. We're playing similar games. 
Do we need integration tests? They're almost always more expensive and flakier, but they are more representative of production behavior. If you need that higher fidelity, that better representative power, you pay for it with those increased costs. But if you get enough predictive power from your unit tests, that's fine. What's the value of writing a book? Hopefully a thing like a book is useful for others when thinking about the workflow or various steps, and maybe it helps reduce the defect generation rate, but I still don't know how to measure that difference in this instance. Uh, directly estimating the value of an educational intervention like a book or a class still totally eludes me. I'm just gonna keep doing it even if I can't prove that it matters. In the end, I think a lot of this boils down to a few insights. We're never gonna convincingly answer the question of what's the value of preventing this defect from manifesting for users. We just need to stop asking it. We may in fact want to find clearer terminology to separate the defects that actually affect users and the bottom line versus those that are just a matter of the refinement process, the quality process that is part of producing quality software. I think it's vastly easier to look at the aggregate defect cost reduction rather than the value of an individual defect. And the natural units for a lot of these things, I think, are human hours. And this works particularly well as a rough estimate for the cost of defect detection and mitigation. Also, if you look at the citation list here, you might note there's a solid amount of thinking and research on all of these topics. As someone that was deeply skeptical of most business and tech writing, I think there's actually surprisingly solid advice out there. And I, I would encourage you to take it from me, a former skeptic, there's good stuff out there. There is also bad stuff out there for sure, but there is plenty of good. I had a conversation with Nicole Forsgren of Accelerate a few years ago, and she gave me the following offhanded quote. She said, accountants still have meetings about best practices in accounting, and accountants are mentioned in the Bible. Software engineering is just over 50 years old. We're still figuring it out. Give us a minute. Or you could look at Mary Shaw's classic talk on our progress towards be being a true engineering discipline. It has taken a couple millennia to make bridge building into a basically automatable process. And that perspective is really important to keep in mind. This is a very new discipline. Best practices and understanding are still evolving. None of this is truth at the level of physical law. It's all emergent observation. 20 years ago, it was not shocking to find groups that weren't using version control, but today it is. In another five or 10, that will also be true about testing and CI. But it's one thing to follow the norms and consensus best practice as if it was fashion. It's a completely different beast to step back and look at the workflow holistically and try to optimize the full process. What are each of these things doing for us? But with the right perspective and clear goals in mind, quality, fast cycles, continuous delivery, I think there's a lot that's doable there. And the specifics that you're trading off are gonna be estimates, but even just focusing on the major scaling factors I think can help us figure out where to invest. I'm always saying that software engineering is not the same thing as programming. Usually that's just in the context of reminding people to think about the long term and the importance of teamwork and collaboration. But in results that we get from Dora or DevOps practices in writings like the Phoenix Project, in thinking from greats like Mary Shaw, we can also be reminded that as a distinct entity, there is also space for treating the process of software engineering as a distinct problem. Understanding that holistically and applying some process management to that understanding can reinforce and justify best practices while giving us some ability to localize and customize the workflow based on individual team and organizational context. In the end, it's about time and people. Thank you. Thank you, Titus. Uh, let's move on to questions and answers. And uh, let me uh, forewarn everyone that um, having done this once before, being the moderator of the questions, uh, at this point in the talk, you're all hundreds of you are going to pounce and uh, post questions. And please bear with us as we try to uh, deal with that fire hose of questions coming at us. Uh, so Titus, the, the first question uh, is about the Phoenix Project book that you mentioned early on. And the, the question is, what is your take on the applicability of the theory of constraints uh, to software engineering at scale? Um, I would have to look up what exactly that term of art is being used for, but I think by and large, like in, in the broad sense, I'm a huge fan of constraints. Um, in writing the, the Flamingo book, uh, 
we wanted every chapter to hit on the trade-offs of time, uh, uh, how things change over time and scale, uh, how you know this is going to work and when you're 10 times larger and, and what are you really trading off? And almost every chapter independently also came up with, hey, it turns out that if you're looking at organizational efficiency, constraints are essential. Um, so, you know, big, big, big fan in that sense. It sounds, uh, you know, a little authoritarian for like, hey, yeah, I don't actually want to give you a million choices here. But uh, I think that's that's part of what comes with getting a paycheck. I hope that's close enough to what the question intended. But. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you agree with the statement that software is an asset and code is a liability? Yeah, totally. Um, our job is to solve problems, right? Very much like what Mary Shaw, uh, Mary Shaw said. Um, our job is not to sit down and write code. Uh, code happens to be the medium that we use sparingly to solve problems in an ideal sense. Uh, but, you know, that's that's uh, not our in instinct in so many cases. Like, it feels like it takes a long time to convince a lot of, you know, junior engineers, new grad sorts of hires, that the job is not sit down and write code. The job is solve problems. And I think that that's unique to our discipline and, and probably has something to do with how we learn it. Because, you know, in aeronautical engineering, it's not a whole lot of aeronautical engineers that are like, yay, I got to use another ton of titanium today. Like your job is to solve the problem of getting people from place to place safely, uh, not to just use as much aluminum and titanium as you can manage. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here is that uh, in many industries, end-to-end -end tests take hours. Uh, what would you do differently uh, or what would be your advice if you had hundreds of such tests that you needed uh, as part of your quality process? So one of the things that I really loved when I was I was sitting in a DORA presentation, uh, just listening to what they were saying to, to groups that they were consulting with, and their target, uh, I wish I had it more precise, I wish I had it written down, but their, their suggestion is set targets to uh, put out twice as many releases set targets to abandon half as many releases, set targets to reduce your test latency uh, by some amount, right? And just set that as a standing annual sort of thing. I know that in a lot of cases, we just, we only have those end-to-end -end things. And those are slow and expensive. And I think the best way to start to ramp that down is one, get permission from above to work on the quality aspect, which I'm trying to help motivate with talks like this. And two, to like look at what are the types of actual defects, not false positives that are being identified by those end-to-end -end tests. And is there a consistent mechanism that might spot that earlier, right? In a lot of cases, those are uh, that there's been a notion that, well, we're not going to rely on unit tests because we don't know how to write them or they slow down the development process uh, and they don't catch everything. So we'll only do the expensive thing. But you're only doing the very expensive thing. You're only doing the, I'm going to tear up the entire house instead of looking in my pockets for the keys. And so if you can find, hey, I often seem to leave my keys here and add that to your list of like, you know, problem solving techniques, uh, that's, that's gonna pay off, right? It's gonna take a little time, but the more that you can like make those end-to-end -end tests uh, either faster or just less load bearing, right? Like that's extremely valuable, uh, but it, it absolutely is gonna take work. It's gonna take probably, you know, some fraction of your time for years to get to a point where you have a healthy balance of quick, fast talks or tests versus the extremely expensive, I don't even know what those results mean sort of tests. So I hope that helps. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is about the slide that you showed uh, that was the timeline and had a variety of different development activities um, yep. uh, that gets closer and closer to deployment on the right side. And the question is, 
Uh, that timeline begins with design on your slide. Uh, do you have any general observations about the quality or the size of the requirements or the process that generate them that would also uh, refer to the general um, theme of your talk here? I mean, I think how much design do you need is very much like how much string do you need? Like you need as much as it takes to solve the problem at hand. Uh, sometimes you're, you know, making a shirt that's going to take a lot of thread. And sometimes you're just trying to truss a chicken. That's a much different thing. Um, I don't think that there's universal guidance for how formal or complicated, you know, any particular design process should be, but it is not an accident that design happens very far to the left, right? Like if you realize that you're building the wrong thing, that can very often save you months or years. Uh, there's a great story internally just recently about a guy that spent six months like getting all of the design permissions uh, to re-architect some processing pipeline. And when he went to like the junior engineer that got assigned to help him implement that, it was it's like, wait, there's a, there's a mechanism in our existing query engine that'll just do this for free. It's a side effect of existing systems. The whole six month project disappeared in that one sentence. Uh, that's a huge, like, It'd be better if that happened earlier, but they are like they distinctly saved months of development effort. Could have been even more, right? And I, pros, like sit down, talk, write, ask questions. This is a much better first instinct for an engineer than sit down and write some code. Does that address the question? I hope. Uh, well, Titus, uh, we have uh, dozens more questions for you to take a look at after the talk. And I know that the uh, last time you did something like this that you really enjoyed uh, going through and giving those answers, although it may take a while to get to all those. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm sorry that we've come to the end here today. Uh, I want to thank you for the talk and uh, want to thank everyone who's in attendance uh, for taking the time to attend today. Uh, this talk was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. You can find announcements on upcoming talks and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. Also, please fill out our quick survey where you can suggest future topics or speakers, which you should see on your screen in just a moment. In just a moment. On behalf of the ACM, Titus Winters and myself, uh, George Fairbanks, thanks again for joining us. And I hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes the talk. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>